when we see these big discrepancies, that's when we want to ask, like, what is going on here? Because it's usually a sign of neurodiversity and some processing, developmental, attentional, executive functioning, auditory vision. There's something going on that's getting in the way. And the thing is, most teachers know it. They just don't always have the tools or the resources or the system to know what to do with it. What supports do kids and teens who are twice exceptional, meaning they're both cognitively gifted plus they have another disability or diagnosis, need? And how can we, parents, educators, and mental health professionals, identify and appropriately support them? Today's guest is Dr. Dan Peters. He's a psychologist at the Summit Center in California, host of the Parent Footprint podcast, and author of the recent book, Bright Complex Kids, Supporting Their Social and Emotional Development. And we'll talk about what these kids need right here on episode 129. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. So if you're here and curious about supporting bright, complex kids, you might be interested in the new virtual course that we have available through the Neurodiversity University. The course is Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students, and it is available right now exclusively to school districts for use for in-house professional development. If you're looking to align your professional development goals with understanding twice exceptional kids, you should check into this. You can use it as a guide for your in-person PD throughout the year, or you can offer it to teachers in your district to complete it on their own. If you want to find out more about this course, go to the website neurodiversity.university. That's neurodiversity.university. My conversation with Dr. Dan is up next. On a previous episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast. I think there is this kind of in our cultural DNA still, this idea that properly behaving, you know, children should be seen and not heard. I think there's kind of this mystical, unspoken idea that behavior management is appropriate and and somehow valued. Somehow with how the research was interpreted as successful, it became the mainstay of our education system. And when you look at the science the neuroscience of resilience, and you lay that side by side to behavioral management, the two don't line up very well. That's episode 116. Find it in your favorite podcast app. You're listening to the Neurodiversity Podcast. I am really excited to welcome Dr. Dan Peters back to the podcast. Dr. Dan is the author of the book, Bright Complex Kids, Supporting Their Social and Emotional Development, and is the host of the Parenting Footprint podcast. So thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be back, Emily. So uh, this isn't the first time that you've been on the podcast. You shared your expertise about stealth dyslexia back on episode 59, Uh, But for those in our audience who aren't familiar with your work, can you give us just a little bit of background? Uh, Yes. Professionally, I am a licensed psychologist and have been practicing as one for um, over two decades now. I also uh, co-founded and am the director of Summit Center, which is a center in California. Our main office is in Northern California, and we have a satellite office in Southern California where we specialize in gifted and twice exceptional individuals. We do uh, lots of uh, psychoeducational neuropsychological testing, lots of counseling, and lots of consultation for um, neurodiverse minds and their families. And um, as you pointed out, I, um, I've done some writing, I've done a lot of speaking, and um, I really enjoy being a fellow podcaster 
And I happen to be a parent, uh, a parent of three of these of these people as well. Yes, bright, complex kids. H- how old are your kids now? They are, um, our oldest is turning 22 in a month, and um, we have a 20-year-old uh, and a newly 18-year-old. Oh, wow. They're like practically you know, on their way into this crazy world. <laughs> yes, I put I put adults in, in quotes, emerging adults. I sometimes talk with my clients who are getting ready to go on to college and or whatever, usually going on to college. And um, they'll say things like, I don't know, I'm going to turn 18. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to be an adult. I have to go to college. I have to be responsible. I'm like, well, college is really like the halfway house to adulthood. It's not quite, you don't have all the responsibilities quite yet. <laughs> totally. It's a, the protective environment. Um, I was just talking with a newly uh, graduated uh, client who was really stressing about being an adult. And um, now that he's in the adult world and has a teaching job, and he's like, you know what, I feel like I am an adult, a little a adult, like it's, <laughs> it's not as scary as I thought it would be. I'm like, yeah, one, one day at a time. Isn't it so strange sometimes, especially for the kids that we work with, when they're 17, 18 years old, and we tell them, okay, figure out the thing that you want to do for the rest of your life and go. I mean, it's just so overwhelming sometimes. So overwhelming. And, you know, um, that makes me think of um, a colleague who has been in the field, um, Sylvia Rim, Dr. Sylvia Rim, who's a leader psychologist in the field. Oh, yeah. And um, I was at a conference with her long before COVID, um, and I was watching her keynote. And her point was, um, she had a phrase for it that we like over passion kids. Like we, we tell kids that they need to find their passion. And she said, it's basically a setup because not all of us are lucky enough to find a passion. And really we need to help kids step into the world and be productive and understand how the world works. And yes, a goal is to find your passion. But she said, I didn't find my passion until I was 45 years old. And she said, if I knew that I needed to find it by age 20 or I had or I would be lost, you said that would have been a very unhelpful message for me. Yeah. And we do emphasize that. I mean, I think sometimes helping kids, I feel like there are some individuals and, and kids, you know, or or young adults who feel like they really do need to have that connection to whatever their work might be, their career might be. But it's okay to just have a career that is, you know. It's a job and you enjoy it enough. Right. It doesn't have to be the be all and end all. No. And hopefully we have something else in our life that we love to do, right? How many people do we know with these amazing hobbies and um, weekends and nights and summers? And um, that's the balance, right? They do a job that um, hopefully is good enough for fulfillment, um, but you find your passions or your interests in multiple ways. So with all your time that that you've spent working with this population in your field specifically, I'm curious, I know for me, just since I started, you know, and I started as a teacher and then entering the clinical mental health field, there have been so many changes in our understanding of what it means to be bright or neurodivergent or fill in the blank. And I'm curious, like, what are the biggest changes or shifts that you've seen take place in how we understand and support kids who kind of fall into that category? Great question. And I can't believe I've been doing this long enough to even be asked this question. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you said two decades. I've been doing it for two, two decades, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. It just, it's just bizarre to like think back um, having all brown hair and more of it than <laughs> I do now. Okay, so something that really wasn't a word is neurodiversity. Mm-hmm. And something that was an emerging word was twice exceptionality. And so in terms of just paradigms, you know, you and I share the passion and work in the twice exceptional realm. And that the the understanding of twice exceptionality, the um, the myth busting that fortunately continues to happen that you can be bright and have uh, some sort of developmental challenge or disability or difference um, can coexist more and more people are becoming aware of that and more and more people are embracing it and more and more people are writing wonderful books like yours um, 
your teacher book, which is right there on my bookshelf, and mm-hmm. your parent book, which I can't wait to get my hands on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's 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 becoming. There's resources. There weren't resources. There weren't. There, I don't remember any resources for Twice Exceptionality except the Twice Exceptional newsletter, which was mm-hmm. just a wonderful gift um, to have. The other thing is neurodiversity, right? Neurodiversity, I feel that the neurodiversity movement, right, and uh, very much core to your podcast and your podcast mission has really helped all neurodiverse profiles um, move ahead and with the understanding, whether it's autism spectrum, whether it's gifted, whether it's twice exceptionality, dyslexia, stealth dyslexia, any of it. There's a broader movement to understand that um, people have many people have different brains designed to do different things. And the increased in strength based and talent based work has really is starting to move forward. We had the positive psychology movement um, in the 90s, which really helped um, just like, let's look at what's right with people and, st- and what makes people healthy and well instead of what's wrong. And I f- feel the field of neurodiversity and the field of twice exceptionality and giftedness has just really benefited from that work and taking it to a next level with the challenge being how to provide this kind of ideology and paradigm for all kids, not just neurodiverse kids. Like what's right with you? How do we develop what you're good at, what you like, instead of just focusing on things that are wrong or not working as well as we think they should be? Yeah, the deficits. I don't think I've talked about it on the podcast, but I know I've said it in different presentations. But my first year teaching was the 2001-2002 school year. And I remember the school counselor coming to me at one point in time and saying, you know, this particular student that's in your class, I think that that this student might have this thing that I just learned about at the state school counseling conference called Asperger's. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and I, as a first-year teacher, had never even heard of it. Mm. But this was <laughs> this was the school counselor, and she had been there you know, she wasn't brand new, right. but she had not even understood that. And so like our awareness of that, what that spectrum really means, what that can look like, and especially then the how that can layer with giftedness along with those other diagnoses, it, it is amazing how much of a change there's been. Isn't it hard for you to imagine yourself as a grown-up professional now not knowing about that stuff? Yeah. Like it doesn't even seem possible, right? Although, I mean, I talk to a lot of teachers who are just beginning on that path to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. If you're not in that world, you sometimes don't realize that there's still so much misunderstanding and stigma surrounding all those diagnoses, you know, that kind of fit under that umbrella. When I was coming up through graduate school, um, that was when there was the main focus on ADHD. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was where Ritalin still was the only medicine uh, because of the patent. And there was lots of work by Russell Barkley, and I would go to all the conferences, and I worked with uh, therapeutic camps, and that became my first expertise because it was like that's that's what my mentor was doing. That's what that's what the field was talking about, and that's just you know one aspect of the whole neurodiverse. I mean, when I when I learned about giftedness as a thing beyond the classes that my friends were all in, <laughs> and learned about twice exceptionality all of these experiences just came rushing to me. You know, here I had been in practice for a while. I'm like, oh my gosh, and all these faces and all these names of all these kids that fit this profile, and I wasn't trained to look at it that way. It's also interesting that both in the educational and the psychological settings, there's so much more awareness about neurodiversity as far as those diagnoses. So the ADHD, the autism, the dyslexia, those pieces... But there's still a lot of misunderstanding about how giftedness plays into that. Yes. And it, what's interesting is when I think back of some of these kids that I worked at a, AD, a therapeutic camp for ADHD for several years, um, and there were these kids that they were different. Like, I couldn't put my finger on it except that they would get in verbal duels with me and the other staff <laughs> that, like, I couldn't even believe I was losing an argument and that I would forget what I was even arguing about with some, these kids with this high verbal intelligence. And there was this intensity and sensitivity to some of them that was different than what I would call just more traditional impulsivity and hyperactivity. 
And so, yes, it's like it's the nuances of these gifted kids who also have these other differences because the symptoms don't present exactly like the textbook. So, for example, very bright kids on the spectrum are thought to not have empathy and not to understand a lot of the social dynamics and social nuances. Well, a lot of these kids, these gifted kids, actually do feel feel it. Um, And I'm not saying just the gifted kids. They do feel it. They have these sensitivities and they don't know how to express it. They don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. That layer is so important when thinking about helping a child understand themselves, helping a parent understand their child and putting together what we call like a treatment plan or a health plan or a wellness plan. It changes when we think about the layers of their advanced thinking or their high creativity when looking at how to support them. You know, you just have to view all of those things through that lens of giftedness. It's just a different layer and it kind of changes how you conceptualize what that unique child's needs are. And, you know, when we think about the counseling that we have done over the years, you you just, you quickly know kids don't like to be talked down to, Mm -hmm. but gifted kids really don't like to be talked down to. And you are just done. Like the moment you open your mouth, you are just done if you are not coming in with an orientation of respect and an orientation of honoring their cognitive ability and and not talking down to them. I like so many sessions, first sessions in the past would start with, you know, I've been to therapists before and I basically think that all you guys do is sit and nod your head and say, repeat the same stupid things that don't help me. And I found, <laughs> I found responding in a very open, authentic way was, you know what? I have found the exact same thing, unfortunately. I totally get what you're coming from. (laughs) And the moment you see me or feel I'm doing it, please tell me because I can't stand doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And And then it's all like, oh, okay, this guy might have an opportunity to understand me. I think sometimes parents and and teachers, I don't know, we fall into this traditional hierarchy Mm -hmm. and certain people deserve respect and that there's this power structure there. And I would say both gifted kids but also autistic kids, because of some of the social communication pieces and how they see that, like, that's just not going to fly. <laughs> no. But if you try to force it and make them do that, they will rebel and push back, and you're just not going to get anywhere. Totally. And you're making me think of a client I've known uh, on and off for several years, and um, he's now in his adolescence, and he had to really work through his traumatization of being an ABA. So he's profoundly gifted and on the spectrum. Oh, yeah. And he had vivid memories of being four, five with an ABA therapist that from his remembering um, was very disrespectful. Like, why would I have to go to the bathroom and eat when I don't have to go to the bathroom and when I'm not hungry. Mm -hmm. And it sounded like very traditional ABA therapy, but this is the rub when it comes to gifted kids and highly gifted kids is you have to be really purposeful about how you're treating them because they remember and it doesn't feel good. Yeah, that strong affective memory just is really a part, a a component of that. Mm Mm-hmm. What are some of the telltale signs that parents and teachers might see that could indicate that a child might be twice exceptional? One thing that we talk about a lot is the conundrum. Like, it just doesn't make sense. So you have a child who you perceive to be able to perform or to understand or to verbalize and articulate, for example, at a level that seems beyond his or her years. And the performance doesn't match it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's average or below average, it just doesn't make sense. So you're really looking for these disparities, like high creativity, high verbal intelligence, really articulate, or very high visual spatial intelligence. You know, this is that Minecraft person, that Lego person, that, that, like, that engineer inventive person who's always coming up with stuff, but they can't sit still. They're always, they, they, their handwriting is so sloppy you can't read it. They refuse to write. So when we see these big discrepancies, 
that's when we want to ask, like, what is going on here? Because it's usually a sign of neurodiversity and some processing, developmental, attentional, executive functioning, auditory vision. There's something going on that's getting in the way. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, most teachers know it. They just don't always have the tools or the resources or the system to know what to do with it. Yeah, you mentioned how teachers sometimes struggle to interpret what's going on. And I think quite often they attribute it to lack of motivation or laziness or underachievement mm -hmm. because that kind of makes sense on the surface until you look a little bit deeper. Yes. I mean, it's the easiest explanation. It's the simplest explanation. Um, it's the unfortunate explanation, particularly when you have a child with executive functioning challenges who may or may not have an ADHD profile, because what is a developmental challenge with task initiation and task follow through, to use some buzzwords, is then seen as lazy as opposed to really a deficit or inability to get oneself moving on and track things that are of no interest. <laughs> Um, and which is also the interesting thing to think about is when they're like, they don't do anything. They don't complete anything. But it's like, well, they've designed Minecraft worlds at home <laughs> where they focus for hours on end. So we have to bring that into the conversation, right? That is something. But yes, it's the other thing I want to say, which you're making me think about is how and this is back to the ADHD thing that is like most prominent that most people know about ADHD. So much stuff is assigned to, oh, it must be ADHD. Mm -hmm. It must be an attention issue. It must be. And these kids are so much more nuanced mm -hmm. than that. So even if they do have ADHD, we, we talk about twice exceptionality almost doesn't exist. It's like thrice or quattro. It, it, it's multi-exceptionality is what we talk about. There's, mm -hmm. so, there's so much more to a child's profile. I think also when you start looking at all of those different labels, I often think about it, if you think about it, the multi-exceptionality as like a Venn diagram, <laughs> you've got the giftedness and the ADHD and the autism and whatever. There's a lot of gray area there that's difficult to tease out sometimes. And so finding that appropriate label or diagnosis or whatever can be really difficult. Really difficult. It really helps to take a nuanced approach. And ideally, you're working with someone who has experience with the gifted and the twice exceptional profile and um, the other challenges. So for example, you know, something where I talked about last time, stealth dyslexia, which is so common to me now and common to our center, we just do so much work with it. But the vast majority of educators and psychologists do not know that that's a thing and would never say that someone who can read in the quote average or age uh, grade appropriate level could actually have dyslexia. So there, there, it really is a lot of education needed. And the other complexity, which we're seeing more of, and tell me if, if this is in your neck of the woods too, this, the newer term from the UK, uh, PDA, pathological demand avoidance, which is thought to be a subset now of autism, makes it even more complex because there's these really gifted kids that are on the spectrum in a big way or in a very light way, and they don't want to do anything you tell them to do or ask them to do. And so like, that's a whole nother area of nuance where there's all this willfulness applied, like, oh, they won't do anything. And, and if you talk to some of the adults who have this profile and speak about this profile, they're like, I just, it, it's, I can't do it when I'm made to. Right. It's like, it, it, it's, it's like, it's this reflex. Um, so just another whole layer of, of nuance needed. I participate in a peer consultation group that focuses on neurodiversity affirming clinicians. And we actually just met yesterday and our main topic was about that demand avoidance mm. and how tricky it is. I was actually doing a training with a school district recently. And one of the questions was, okay, so we kind of understand what this pathological or pervasive demand avoidance is. So what do we do with it? Because a lot of it is focused on just that understanding and communication. And I think the way I kind of conceptualize it, and maybe you have something to add or change, but I feel like when you boil it down, it comes down to like providing autonomy, independence, mm -hmm. and control over the situation, and time, mm -hmm. like not rushing things and letting letting things kind of develop as they go. Yep. I feel like for me, those are the things I notice. 
Totally. I totally agree with that. And the only other word that comes to my mind in addition is choice. Yeah. And this is a tough thing for some parents and some educators because, you know, like, hey, who's in charge here? But I also feel like it's really from my experience of as a parent um, and as a clinician, like to me, best practices to help a child of any age in a developmentally appropriate way, given their age and developmental stage, feel in control of their lives. Yeah. And by doing so, you actually give a lot of choice. And PDA or no PDA, kids and gifted kids, twice sexual kids, they step into their lives more when they feel their lives are more theirs. As a gifted ADHD or I was one of those kids that was diagnosed when, you know, my mom was a special educator. And Mm -hmm. again, at a time, they didn't have the term twice exceptional. But I really struggled with school and and grades and everything until I got to college and started taking the classes I wanted to take. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh, okay, I can do this. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, man, it could be like this. Like, it's not just stuff you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I was just reflecting with somebody. I was talking with another friend who's been a guest on the podcast, Amanda Morin. And we were just kind of chatting about some things. And We were talking about how it's frustrating for people who are in this work. What's the phrase about like? Turning the Titanic or something. Thank you. That's that's probably what I was going for. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It like takes (laughs) such a long time. It does. And the other thing about these, um, just brain development, as you alluded to earlier, is, you know, the neuroscience says the frontal lobe is not done until, I mean, it's a range depending on who you look at, 25 to even 28. And what we know about neurodiverse brains when it comes to developing those executive functions, those social skills, which is part of executive functions also, it's delayed. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's like two to four years it, l- delayed. And it's so frustrating when you're just discombobulated or you have what we call this asynchronous development. And I always remember this dad who was at a talk I was doing, and it was a, it was a small breakout venue. And he was there for his child. And then at the end, he felt comfortable enough to talk about his own experience. And he was trying to, uh, I think, comfort some of the other parents that were in this, in this talk. He said, you know, I was one of these kids. And he said, I, when I was in high school and college, people were always too young for me and too old for me. Mm. He said, I was always thinking and talking about things that, seemed to be beyond what my peers were doing. But developmentally, behaviorally, I didn't know about dating. I didn't know about friendship. I didn't know about, you know, like partying. And I had no idea. And he said it wasn't until the end of college and just before getting into graduate school that it all started to click. And he's like, I started to get it. Like I kind of caught up and understood myself more. So I think it's like that to me is the norm for these kids. And it's, it's, I think, for all of us, for parents and teachers and ed- everyone thinking, everyone who cares about these kids, is giving the gift of time and us chilling out with our own anxiety about what milestones our kids should be reaching at what age and when they should leave the home and go to college. It's often a different trajectory. You know, you and I are sitting here and we're talking about all the different ways that Parents can support their kids, but I think you can relate to this, but I frequently remind parents that parenting, quote unquote, experts aren't necessarily the experts on their child. Yes. So how can parents approach their child and not only collaborate, but also learn from their child? That really ended up being a core element of the book that you referenced that Gene and I wrote about, Mm -hmm. which is really how to understand our kids and learn from them so we can help them learn more about themselves. And it really comes from a place of wanting to learn and understand as opposed to feeling like we need to be in a place of authority, command, control, and manage and micromanage. And so what I've learned is whatever I know from school and from my clinical work doesn't mean it applies to my own kids at any given time. Yes. <laughs> like my best moments as a parent have actually been when I didn't have a plan and I was thoughtful and authentic and transparent. Like those were my like the most effective moments in hindsight. Mm-hmm. 
as opposed to, well, if this happens, I should do this. And if this happens, I'm going to do this. And if they do this, then we need to do this. It's too simplified and it doesn't work with these kids. And it's like, we're on this code journey with them as they're becoming who they are and learning about themselves every day. And we have never done the parenting thing before at whatever age they are with them and whatever their unique profile is. Mm -hmm. And the best thing I could say from a, a podcast that my wife had sent me, the, the guest who also has a podcast, um, was talking about, he, he was talking about the butterfly, the caterpillar and the butterfly. And he said, a caterpillar has no idea what's happening to it. No idea that it's emerging into a butterfly. And it's messy, and it's scary, and it's weird, and it's losing pieces, and it's gaining pieces, and all of a sudden it emerges. And I thought that was the most beautiful, helpful idea to think about ourselves as growing humans who happen to be parents, raising these humans. We're all becoming and you don't even know until you look back over your shoulder after it actually happens. And I feel if we can go into these situations with that sort of openness and as a, you know, a recovering perfectionist, what I would say to people is like, go into it with messy is okay. Like it is messy. It's going to be messy and embrace the messiness as opposed to seek perfection. And we just muddle through. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dan. This has been awesome. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Emily. Always a great connection. These bright, complex kids are living life at both ends of the bell curve. The layering of incredible strengths and abilities with the difficulties that come along with a disability like ADHD, autism, or dyslexia can be confounding not only for the people who support TUI kids, but for the kids themselves. They need unique social and emotional support because of who they are. But the long-term outlook for these neurodivergent gifted kids is bright, especially when they are allowed to be authentically themselves. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Our thanks to Dr. Dan Peters. He's the host of the Parenting Footprint podcast. You can find out more about him as well as his book, Bright Complex Kids, on the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Thanks to Martin Clem, Arian, Gamma Skies, and The Big Letdown. They made the music featured on today's episode. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our social media and production assistant is Krista Brown. The executive producer and coffee runner that's me dave morris for everyone here thanks for listening we'll see you next time this is a service of the neurodiversity alliance